Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Welcome to the first of the series of podcast, The Authority, looking at the great authors. Um, and uh, I'm going to begin by talking about how we actually read. Um, we're going to talk about reading, uh, reading authors, reading the great works of literature, perhaps a few words about how we read. And there's, uh, there's two ways of reading, as there's two ways of actually thinking, objectively and subjectively. We need to, we need to sort of get, get our own pride and prejudice out of the way uh, and try to see what the author uh, is, is doing with the work, um, to not take our prejudice to it, but to allow ourselves to grow in the presence of the author. That's why the author is the authority. That's the rationale. So um, each each episode, we're going to be looking at the authors of the work and, and their importance before discussing the work themselves. That's the way we're going to be progressing. And we're going to go through chronologically from, from the earliest times, uh, the sort of the, the foundations of Western civilization, and then move through time, uh, at least for the first you know uh, episodes, and then at some point we'll mix things up. So we're going to begin with what who might be called the father of Western literature, in many ways, and that's the great Homer, the great Greek uh, author. Uh, and, you know, when I say the, the authorial authority, we need to know as much as we can about the author. Well, when you go that far back in time, there's a problem because we don't know much about Homer uh, at all. Um, the, 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 the general view is he might have been blind, and that's based upon the fact that there's a poet who appears in the Odyssey, uh, Demodocus, who, uh, who, who is blind, and some people see that as a, as a, Homer signing his own work, you know, his signature. But really, we don't know much about him. We don't even know exactly when he lived, but it was sometime between 850 and 700 BC. So, you know, between 700 and 850 years before the birth of Christ. So a long time ago. And he's writing uh, his two great epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, concern uh, the Trojan War uh, and, and its aftermath. So um, so the next thing we need to know is, well, when was the Trojan War? And again, historians, the Siege of Troy, historians, you know, are divided. But generally speaking, uh, it was sometime between 1334 and 1150 BC. So between 1,150 years before the birth of Christ, or maybe as early as 1,334 years before the birth of Christ. So the important thing here is that there is uh, depending on the range, something like a four or five hundred year time lag from the event that's being talked about in the Iliad and the Odyssey, and uh, Homer's actually writing about it. So, um, so the Iliad and the Odyssey are, if you like, historical fiction. Uh, for for Homer, the Siege of Troy is also by this time the stuff of legend. So, you know, he's using poetic license to tell a good story. We can't see it as a work of history, although it, it's a work of historical fiction. Um, another thing I think we need to know about Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey is um, how, where does it fit into the golden age of Greek philosophy? You know, the, at the foundations of, of Christian philosophy uh, are part of, part of course, from the, from the theology which comes from the Bible and the teachings of Christ. Philosophically speaking, uh, uh, that St. Augustine baptizes Plato and St. Thomas Aquinas baptizes um, uh, Aristotle. So these figures are, are huge as regards um, the foundations of faith and reason upon which uh, the Catholic faith is built. Um, well, Homer predates that. So the Golden Age of Greek philosophy is between 450 BC and 350 BC. So Homer's writing about uh, three or 400 years earlier than that. But, and this is important, it's quite clear that uh, Homer is living in a very 
philosophical culture. He's, he asks all sorts of deep questions uh, in, in, in the two epics that take us deeper into an understanding of ourselves, uh, our understanding of nature, uh, our understanding of our neighbor, uh, our understanding of, of human sin and wickedness and suffering. Uh, and even, although of course he's a pagan, something about our, our understanding of our relationship with God, which we'll, which we'll talk about when we get to discussing the works, which we'll be doing imminently. But the important thing is that the history is like a jigsaw puzzle in which many pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are missing. And it's, it's perilous if we assume that the missing pieces of the jigsaw puzzle don't exist. Um, on the contrary, to understand history, you have to understand there are there are missing pieces of the puzzle. So this would be an example. We don't know of any philosophers who are around the same time as Homer, but it's quite clear from reading the Iliad and the Odyssey, there's a philosophical culture. So they were philosophers, and we can deduce the fact that they were philosophers, even though we don't know their names. So now I'm now going to talk about the two epics of Homer, the Iliad. Uh, and uh, the Odyssey. And we'll begin with the Iliad. And first of all, it's an inaccurate title. You know, some titles are better than others. The, the Iliad means basically uh, Troy. It's a work about Troy. And it isn't because uh, the, 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 the action of, of the Iliad takes place um, only over a period of very few weeks, right at the end of the siege. Uh, the, the siege has been going on for years. Um, and we, we get a little bit of the backstory, but basically it, it's taking place just over a few weeks uh, towards the end of the siege. And we don't even see the end of the siege. That's also off camera. Um, the, uh, the, the epic ends with the death of Hector and not even with the death of Achilles, which we know is going to come afterwards. So it's very it's a snapshot of one part of the siege of Troy and that war. So it's it's really a, 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 a not about Troy per se. It's an inaccurate title, but it's historical fiction, as we've said. It's also a cautionary tale, which means it has a moral. It teaches us uh, about morality, and it has a theological dimension. It teaches us about man's relationship with the gods, um, so with the divine. So the, all these things are going going on in the uh, in the Iliad. One thing I want to say also is the difference between, shall we say, classical literature uh, in, 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 in the sense of the Greek classics and romantic literature, which really comes in, in the 19th century. Um, the difference is that romantic literature is all about feeling and often you know, we're taken into the head and the heart of the characters. In a, in, a, in a romantic novel. So we, we know what they're thinking. We know what they're feeling. We're being told. It's almost as if we're God. We, you know, we, we, we have this omniscience, this uh, uh, knowledge of everything that's going on, including people's thoughts and emotions. The, the, the Greeks, actually, the classical model, you don't see that. You, all you see is what people do and what people say. We don't see what they're feeling, except insofar as we can tell what they're feeling by what they're saying or what they're doing. So in many respects, classical literature is more realistic because, of course, we, um, in real life, we can't read what someone else is thinking. We can't uh, know exactly what they're feeling. We have to make a judgment call on those by how they're behaving or what they're saying. So the, what the, the, the Greek approach, uh, this classical approach, is actually much more realistic in the sense of it's how we uh, experience reality in observing others in order to understand the truth, rather than having this omniscient, godlike, divine power of seeing inside their heads. So how does uh, how does the um, the epic begin? The Iliad. Well, it begins with a prayer. It begins with sing, goddess, um, and the goddess is the muse. Um, so the, the muse is the creative power, the creative talent. So uh, obviously we don't believe in a goddess uh, who, who's this muse that allows epic poetry to be written, but we do believe that uh, that creativity is a, a gift uh, of grace, that it's given to us. Uh, moments of inspiration are somehow divine. So it's appropriate for a Christian writer before writing anything to begin with a prayer that our words might be 
his words, that uh, we are doing his will in what we're writing, that somehow or other he would inspire our words and our works, that they may be a true reflection of him. So we should uh, begin our own writing with a prayer to God. So it's appropriate that Homer begins the, the writing of the Iliad with a prayer to the creative gift, gift and the, the creative giver of the gift sing muse and what does the goddess sing goddess what does the goddess uh what does he ask the goddess to help him do he helps he asks her to help him tell a good story um and the story he wants to tell is uh sing goddess of the anger of achilles and its destructiveness and the will of zeus which is accomplished. So what Homer does is what you'll be told if you go to an MFA program, do an MFA program in creative writing. One of the things you'll be told is don't give away the plot of the story in the first page, on the first page. And that's exactly what Homer does. One of the greatest writers ever tells us exactly what it's going to be about. It's going to be about Achilles. Uh, it's going to be about Achilles' anger. It's going to be about the destructive consequences of Achilles' anger. And it's going to be about uh, how that anger and the destruction that it causes, in other words, the sin and the destruction it causes, somehow uh, it, through all that, the will of God is accomplished. So there's a theological uh, dimension. Um, so it's a, of course, you'll tell, first of all, it's the, the old story pride precedes a fall. It's Achilles' pride which is the root of his anger. And that anger is destructive, not just of Achilles' enemies, but also of his friends, his best friend, Patroclus as well, uh, and ultimately self-destructive. It, 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 it ends in Achilles basically destroying himself, his own death. So the, the moral is that pride and the anger, which is its bitter fruit, is destructive. Um, but, and even deeper, the lessons that we learn from the negative consequences of pride and of sin is something that God wants us to learn, that the will of Zeus is accomplished in the lessons taught by the consequences of evil. So you can see how the even these very old, ancient, classic uh, epics um, uh, reflect, dovetail with um, the, uh, a Christian understanding of morality. Um, we need to understand that, uh, that the Greeks... Uh, in their philosophy were laying the foundations of reason, but also in their stories, uh, they are also laying the foundation of uh, Western art and literature, which is taken up by, by Christian authors uh, following Christ. The other thing about the, the, the Iliad that's very interesting is the relationship of Zeus, the father of the gods, to the other gods. Uh, so obviously we're talking about a, a polytheistic cosmos not a monotheistic cosmos that the christians believe in where there's one god but polytheistic cosmos where there are many gods but what's interesting is that zeus appears to be more powerful than all the other gods and not just more powerful than all the other gods individually more powerful than all the other gods put together so he says uh, that uh if there was a tug of war and zeus was holding one end of, of uh, the rope and all the other gods were holding the other end of the rope. And he's, he's saying this to all the gods uh, that, that gathered together. He said that if we had that tug of war and I was at one end and all of you were the other, I would win. And the other gods don't dispute it. They don't argue with him. They don't, they don't certainly don't say, well, let's try it. So it's as if the other gods know that ultimately there's nothing any of them to do, can do either individually or collectively to, to thwart the will of Zeus. They may delay it. They may uh, they may get from Zeus some sort of uh, reluctant promise on his part to let them do things that are not ultimately Zeus's uh, will, but ultimately Zeus's will will be done. So there's this this relationship between God versus the gods, and in some sense that's not hugely dif different from a Christian understanding. We believe in one God who's all powerful, but we also believe in supernatural beings who are not God. Uh, they're angelic, uh, and some of the some of those angelic beings are good, 
the angels and some of them are bad, the demons. And there's a war on this supernatural level that's going on uh, in the fabric of the cosmos that we are only in our natural way of understanding things because we, 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 we don't live fully in that supernatural space until we get to heaven. Um, that we don't fully know what's going on, but it's going on. We know there's a war going on between the angels and the demons, uh, and that that, that that impacts our own lives, it, it impacts our own hearts. The battle between good and evil takes place in every human heart, and that's a battle between angels and demons as well as our own will. So we see here, you know, a, a harmony even in, in, in parts of the epic we might not think would be the case, uh, even on the level of theology or, or, or divinity up to a point. Another important part of, of the Iliad uh, and the Odyssey is, is the Greek word of xenia, X-E-N-I-A, xenia. Uh, xeno, it, 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 it means foreigner. So something like xenophobia is a fear of foreigners. But the, the law of xenia was the, um, the obligation on the part of people to be courteous and hospitable to strangers uh the 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 idea is that you know the stranger at your door could be a god or a goddess in disguise uh, and if you don't if you don't treat the stranger with hospitality you might be insulting a god and that of course would be would be destructive so the 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 onus is upon uh the the host to be hospitable to the stranger of course the other side of that is the the the, the uh the, the 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 stranger the guest has um has a moral obligation to be to behave responsibly and courteously towards the host right it's a, it's a it's a, a, a two way uh, uh uh relationship here of of responsibility so zeus is known as the amongst amongst his many titles as the guest god Right, he's the god of guests. So the original sin, if you like, that sets up the siege of Troy, which is the backdrop to the, the war that's 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 that's, that's the, the, the background of the of the poem, was when um uh Menelaus uh hosts Paris, a Trojan, a stranger, uh a guest in his house, and Paris betrays that law of Xenia by eloping with Menelaus's wife, Helen, uh, and also taking some of Menelaus's possessions with him. So theft, so adultery, theft, elopement. So Paris breaks that uh, divine law of Xenia, and that's what sets the war in motion. And that's why um, the Greeks morally are in the right, because they're demanding the return of, of, of Helen. Uh, and it's uh, the refusal of that return which causes the war. And so the, the Greeks are, are morally uh, in the right. There's no doubt about that. But then we have Hector. Hector, Paris's brother, uh, he, he, what, he finds himself in a position he has no real choice but to defend his country, his people, his wife, his son, and there's some wonderful scenes of, 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 of domestic scenes with Paris, you know, uh, with his wife and, and, and infant son uh, and, and that love that they have for each other. He's defending his, 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 his homeland, his people, his family, his wife, his son from this attack. That's why Hector is sometimes called uh, blameless, blameless Hector. He's the innocent victim of the sin of Paris and Helen. Um, and, 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 and in that sense, in some sense, we can see him uh, only up to a point, but as a Christ figure, the blameless victim of the sins of others who lays down his life for his, uh, for his friends and countrymen and wife and child. Um, one thing we see in, in the Iliad and the Odyssey is th what the Greeks understand about death. And this is a very big difference between a Christian understanding and a pagan understanding that there's a vision of Patroclus, uh, Achilles' friend after he's killed, uh, who visits him uh, as a ghost. He's, 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 he's died, he's been killed as a consequence of Achilles' anger. Uh, but he's like a shadow. He's no real substance to him. You can't hug him. It's like, uh, you know, some, something that's less real, a shadow of his former self. Uh, the word used for a ghost sometimes is a shade, right? Something which is only a shadow. Now, 
that means that you know when we die according to the greeks we enter the shadow lands where uh this is the real world of flesh and blood and when we die we become less real we become shadows of our former selves now from a christian perspective as c.s lewis tells us it's the other way around that 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 this is the shadowlands where we live is the shadowlands this is not the fullness of reality the fullness of reality comes when we find ourselves in the presence of jesus christ in heaven with a beatific vision and when we become the perfect human persons we're meant to be through being sanctified and, and going to heaven the, the real world begins the real world of, of eternity eternal flesh and blood on a much more realistic level with the real presence of christ in a much more real sense than in the sacrament that happens after death where we see him face to face this is the shadow land so there's a very big difference there be between the two which we see in the way that the afterlife is presented in homer's works a very important thing to remember about about the the iliad is that there's the moral is given very subtly uh, in book 23 which is the penultimate book so right near the end um, we have this ba battle going on we know that the destructive consequences of of, of Achilles' anger we see that that hector being the blameless victim defending his country um but at the end the, the, there's a there's a chariot race and the chariot race in book 23 is resolved. Someone cheats, and because someone cheats, there's going to be a, a, a fight and, and bloodshed uh, because of someone cheating during the chariot race. And instead of it being allowed to descend into that bloodshed, the um, uh, they 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 through through magnanimity, through generosity, uh, through contrition, through uh, confession, uh, that uh, that that peace is restored there's no need for war and it's as if homer is saying it didn't need to be like this that this 10-year siege and war could have been averted if people had shown generosity of spirit magnanimity uh contrition uh uh to confess the sin make things right uh and then be forgiven war could have been avoided so we do have a very uh a christian uh, a, a proto-Christian, a quasi-Christian moral at the heart of the Iliad. And the other very interesting thing about the Iliad, it does not, it begins with Achilles. Uh, and, you know, you normally think about balance, uh, symmetry in a work of literature. It begins with Achilles. Uh, you think it would end with Achilles, right? Uh, it's, it's sing news of, uh, of, of the anger of uh, Achilles and its destructiveness and the will of Zeus is accomplished. Perhaps we should end with the death of Achilles, uh, that would be balanced, but that's not what Homer does. Homer ends with the death of Hector. So it ends with, you know, to Hector be the glory. Uh, the focus it, it, it does not end with Achilles, the cause of the problem uh, within, the, within, the, within the epic. It ends with, with the blameless victim who lays down his life for his friends, family and countrymen. Let's now move on to the Odyssey. The other great epic and the big difference between the odyssey uh and and the iliad is the iliad takes place in a very small space just between troy and 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 and, and the waterfront the beach uh, and the battlefield in between the two camps so you know just a few hundred yards um uh, and over a very short period of time the odyssey wanders all over the known world and indeed to mysterious places that are not part of the known world over a period of 10 years so it moves much further geographically and moves much further through time um so it's very different in that sense again the moral is given to us at the beginning the whole odyssey is about odysseus's efforts to get home to his wife son uh, 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 and family uh, after the trojan war and he he it takes him so long because of the, his recklessness, his pride, and the recklessness and pride of others. Um, so right at the beginning, we're given them all by by Zeus. Zeus says to the other gods that that mortals blame us for their suffering when it is their own recklessness that causes suffering beyond that which is given. And this is actually a profound meditation upon the mystery of suffering, that most suffering is certainly caused by our own sinfulness, by our own selfishness. Um, we harm ourselves and we harm others, including the innocent, through our sinful actions. Um, so it's really not appropriate for us to blame God uh, 
for those bad things that happen to us and to others because of the sin, because of our sins and the sins of others, human sin. However, as Zeus also says, uh, you know that, that it's by their own recklessness that suffering comes beyond that which is given. In other words, that some suffering is a gift that it's given to us that we might learn lessons thereby. And so once we're told that up front, we know that's the model we should be looking for. And this journey home takes so long because of um, uh, the sin of, uh, of, of the recklessness and sinfulness and selfishness of, of uh, Jesus's men. And in consequence, they are all killed. None of them make it home. And, Odysseus would have got home expeditiously within weeks, except for his own sin of pride. So the, the, he, he uses his wit. We know he's very resourceful. He's very smart. Uh, he uses his wit to, for, to, to get his men to escape from the, the Cyclops, um, who's going to, uh, to uh, Polyphemus, who's going to eat them. So he uses he uses wit to escape. Uh, he tell, tells Polyphemus, and Polyphemus asks his name. Uh, you know, that I am nobody. And what while Odysseus is nobody, uh, he uh, outwits uh, the evil and escapes with his men. But when he's escaped, he can't resist pridefully shouting back to the Cyclops. I'm not nobody, I am somebody. And I'll tell you the somebody I am. And he gives his name and address. And in direct consequence of that, Polyphemus then prays to Poseidon and says, make uh, Odysseus's journey home long, suffering. Uh, may he never return home. But if it's the will of Zeus that he returns home, so everybody knows that you can't contradict the will of Zeus, then make it hard and make it take a long while. And Poseidon answers that prayer and subject to Zeus, who, who wills Odysseus to get home eventually, Zeus, Zeus allows Odysseus to suffer in consequence of his sin. Now, I want to talk about uh, the two other characters apart from Odysseus before, before we end here, um, because Odysseus begins as as wicked as a pirate, as a, someone who's killing people for no reason whatsoever, breaking the law of Xenia, and then he grows in in virtue uh, as 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 the journey goes on. So that when when he returns home, he returns home not in glory, not leading his men in a triumphal march back home. He returns as a beggar and has to endure uh, insults from the very uh, wicked suitors who are besieging his wife uh hoping to uh force his wife into marrying one of them so he learns his lesson and in various ways we don't have time to talk about he does that the uh, the other two principal characters in it are telemachus that's odysseus's son and there's a rite of passage he begins powerless to do anything about these wicked suitors because he's a boy but he grows up throughout the course of the of the epic and by the end of it he's a man there's a rite of passage um and he shows himself to be as strong as his father and finally we have to talk about penelope because penelope odysseus's wife is the you know one of the great uh, icons of femininity in the whole of western literature and she deserves to be honored as such um she doesn't have m many words she doesn't have much to say she's in some sense a passive figure She's besieged. So there's a parallel between the siege of Troy and uh, and the siege of Penelope, um, the siege of Ithaca. Um, but the, here we have the innocent victim, whereas Helen was was guilty and eloping with Paris. Penelope just wants to doesn't want to marry anybody. She's waiting for the return, uh, hoping against hope that one day her husband will return home to her. Um, and she's pious. She's virtuous, she's wise, she's smart. She's probably more intelligent than any other character in uh, in the Iliad, so in the Odyssey. She reminds me very much of other characters who, who are passive yet wise uh, in Shakespeare, such as Cordelia. So we're going to uh, conclude now by, by saying something about what we can learn from Homer in relation to Western civilization as a whole. He's the father of Western literature. 
what we see is that the the the, the, the pagans um uh, as C.S. Lewis said, and I think I can't think of many better ways of finishing this discussion of Homer than to bring in the great C.S. Lewis. He says that the the, the pagans, the Greek pagans, uh, such as Homer uh, and the philosophers, were like a virgin awaiting the coming of the bridegroom. In other words, the stories that the Greeks told and the philosophy, the reason they were using, were ripening them, ripening the Gentile world for the coming of Christ. So the, the, the pagans as a virgin awaiting the coming of the bridegroom. So Homer, in some sense, is a virgin muse. And, and Lewis talks about the big difference between this virginity of the Greeks with the neo-pagans of today. He says that the, whereas the, the Greeks were the virgin awaiting the coming of the bridegroom, the neo-pagans of today are the divorcee who walks away from the marriage. And needless to say, there's a huge difference between the purity of the virgin awaiting fulfillment in the marriage and the disillusioned divorcee who walks away from the bridegroom. So on that note, and with, with due deference and thanks to C.S. Lewis, we'll end our discussion of Homer in the first of our series on the authority. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.